Everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for rating and reviewing us on iTunes. Thank you for supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Matt Lewis. I'm excited to have back today uh, George Will. He's, of course, a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, and he's out with a new book, American Happiness and Discontent, The Unruly Torrent, 2008 through 2020. George, Will, welcome back to the news. I'm glad to be with you. I have to start off, we're taping this on a Tuesday. I think it's going to run on Wednesday. But uh, there was this memo that came out from a guy named John Eastman, who was like a conservative uh, lawyer who uh, wrote a memo on how Mike Pence could essentially uh, refuse to certify the election. And I just have to ask you, what, what did you think of that? I mean, did it confirm what you already thought, or is this like a, a even worse? Oh, uh, I don't know about even worse. Will's first law of politics is there's no such thing as rock bottom. Uh, so I, th- I think that validates my my instinct. I was amused the other day that Mr. Pence called another former vice president from Indiana, uh, Dan Quayle, and said. What about this? And Quayle sort of you, you had called him, and Quayle had said, "You don't have this power." But one of the strangest aspects of the January sixth imbroglio was people praising Pence for refusing to exercise a power that no sensible person thinks he had, which is a, certainly a, a, a cheap way to get moral standing. But maybe that's where we are. <laughs> I mean, maybe Pence could have tried to do it. And who knows what kind of uproar that would have created, even if he didn't get away with it. So, like, in a way, maybe Mike Pence is as close as we get to, to heroic. Uh, no, uh, th- th- there are, there's more heroism around, beginning with the people who voted to impeach the president and those who stood against the Holly Cruz uh, theatrics. Uh, Pence, is, Pence is pretty far down on the list of, of current heroisms. So I've you know you've been doing the rounds uh, talking about this collection of essays, and one of the things that you've mentioned is how important the Supreme Court is or the the judiciary branch is, and I think uh, that's become evidently true. Um, but that's something that that you changed your mind about, isn't it? In the last fifty years or so, yes, the the biggest change of mind has been uh, fifty years ago. I was with my good friend Bob Bork, was a Borkian, and Bork was an Oliver Wendell Holmes disciple in the sense that Holmes believed that majoritarianism was the central creed of America, that majorities have a right to do what they want because they are majorities with very few restrictions, and therefore conservatives picking up on this and recoiling in part from some of the more uh, uh, exotic Warren Court opinions, began preaching for many years judicial restraint, which meant deference to majoritarian institutions, be they the Congress of the United States or the City Council of San Diego. Uh, I changed my mind. I believe that judicial restraint often is dereliction of judicial duty. It is a judicial duty to supervise and superintend the excesses of democracy. Can I give you a little running jump into this? I grew up in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. My father was a professor of philosophy at the U of I. This is Lincoln country. And according to local lore, it was in the Champaign County Courthouse that Lincoln, then a traveling, prosperous railroad lawyer, learned that Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas had succeeded in passing the Kansas-Nebraska Act. 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act said, we're going to solve the vexing problem of what to do about the status of slavery in the territories by allowing each of the territories, including Kansas and Nebraska, to vote. Vote it up, vote slavery up, vote slavery down, said Stephen A. Douglas, a matter of moral indifference. The important moral point is that majority should have their way. Lincoln's ascent to greatness began with his recoil against that principle, in which Lincoln said, no, we are not a country about a process, majority rule, we're a country about a condition, liberty. Fast forward to the flag salute cases. 
1939, the Supreme Court says, yes, a state can require Jehovah's Witnesses children to salute the flag, even though it violates their conscience because it promotes national unity, et cetera. That was 1939. War clouds were lowering. I understand this. But just four years later, the Supreme Court repudiated that. And in an opinion by Justice Jackson, uh, he said, the very purpose of a Bill of Rights is to place certain things beyond the reach of majorities, above the vicissitude of politics. Well, it's not just the Bill of Rights. The Constitution is an inherently, a written Constitution, an inherently, I won't say anti-majoritarian, but non-majoritarian device. And uh, Alex Bickle at Yale Law School and Bork and others said judicial review poses a counter-majoritarian dilemma. I don't think it's a dilemma at all. It's a great opportunity to rein in majorities, which are can be easily threats to, to, to liberty. What do you make of the fact, though, that this branch of government that is really kind of keeping things from going off the rails is one that was actually not explicitly, or the, the judicial review part of this was not explicitly laid out by the founders. Uh, it's interesting though, that that may be the thing that's our saving grace. Lots of things are not explicitly laid out by the founders that we quickly came to accept, not least of all political parties and other things. Uh, I think if you read the Federalist Papers, particularly Hamilton's contributions, it was clear that for, for the Constitution to be the supreme law of the land, judicial review was implicit. There had been judicial review practiced by colonial governments. So this was not a novel departure in, in the, the human experience with governance. And of course, uh, in 1803 with Marbury versus Madison, it became explicit. Uh, you seem to be, and I've heard, again, I've listened to a few of your, your interviews recently, you seem to believe that um, that Trump will fade away, and that uh, one of our saving another one of our saving graces is boredom. That the American public gets bored easily and and may move on. And I hope you're right, but I guess just talk about that that notion. Well, the forty fifth president was and remains an entertainer, and entertainers have to refresh their act or they become boring and no one turns to a bore for entertainment. Uh, you know, television killed vaudeville. Vaudeville in the old days, you'd take your act from Columbus, Ohio to Duluth, Minnesota to Fort Collins, Colorado. It was fresh everywhere. Then along came television and the Ed Sullivan show and all the rest and people saw your act and then they wanted something else. Donald Trump has been working the same pedal on the organ for 30 years. The only change he's made 30 years ago, Japan was going to eat our lunch. Now it's China's going to eat our lunch. But aside from substituting one Asian country for another, he's had nothing new to say ever. And I just have a feeling that uh, he's he's stale. Now, this could be the Will, Will's thoughts being uh, Will's wishes being the father of Will's thoughts. That could be. But uh, I still have a feeling that the great American thirst for novelty might save us. I definitely think you're right that people do move on and get bored. I don't know if it will be in time <laughs> for 2024. Um, I hope you're right. So you voted for, you voted for Joe Biden. I did. I actually decided, um, and people, a lot of people have criticized me for this, but I decided... I couldn't vote for Trump or Biden in good conscience, so I didn't. Um, but um, but I totally understand and respect people who made you know who made a different decision. How are you feeling about Biden these days, though? Because I feel like he got off to a strong start, and it has been pretty bad the last couple of months. Well, a lot of people are saying, "Gosh, we didn't know it with all the spending and the social programs. We didn't know Biden was this." left wing. He's not. He's not a progressive. He's a Democrat. And the Democratic Party is moving and he goes where the party moves. And the Democratic Party now is being propelled by a compact, intense minority, the progressives. But history is made by compact, intense minorities. I cast my first presidential vote for the, the, the leader of such a compact, intense minority. I voted for Barry Goldwater. And he moved the party permanently to the right. 
and accelerated the process of our sorting out our parties on ideological lines. I'm surprised that uh, Mr. Biden's sense of self-preservation has not asserted itself. Uh, He's not quite old enough to remember, but I am, uh, what happened between 1965 and 1966. Lyndon Johnson routes my my fellow Goldwater. Goldwater loses 44 states. Lyndon Johnson has enormous majorities in, in both houses of Congress. And he embarks on the Great Society in a way that most Americans say, that's not actually what we voted for. Uh, and uh, in 1966, there was a, a, a substantial course correction course correction in in the the alignment in Congress. In 1968, the Republicans won, began a string where they won five out of six presidential elections. Not bad considering in 1964, when the votes came in against Goldwater, people said, well, that's it. The Republican Party is going to go the way of the Whigs. Not exactly. It does seem interesting because, you know, Trump has abandoned people like us who are, you know, conservative, yeah. I don't know, Romney, Rubio type voters, uh, college educated. And there are a lot of people like that. And they may, they could potentially be the swing vote in America. And yet Trump and the Republicans have no interest in this cohort. And really, Biden has not governed as if he believes that we are the swing vote he needs to court. Yes, I think But the people, the question is, did people vote in 2020 for a restoration or for a revolution, transformation of America, which is one of the the current president's current phrases. It seems clear to me that they were suffering Trump fatigue and wanted a rest. They wanted deep breath. They wanted a pause and they didn't get it. Uh, Now, the the Democrats are discovering uh, something that shouldn't come as a sunburst to them. Uh, that living with their progressive cohort is difficult. Uh, And the the progressives are saying, we're going to hold the infrastructure bill, which is a very popular hostage, to the 3.5 trillion, the latest trillion dollar tranches of social spending. Uh, It's conceivable the president could wind up with neither. Uh, I don't think that will happen. The the Democrats are, are not kamikazes at this point. But it could. The fact that it's even conceivable tells you something about the dysfunction within the Democrats. The Republicans' dysfunction is, well, there's a cottage industry writing books about it. The Democrats' dysfunction will get scrutiny sooner rather than later, I think. So it sounds like you think that like AOC, even though she is, you know, just a congressperson, a congresswoman representing, you know, one district, um, but that she actually is the, where the energy is and, and maybe the actual leader of the Democratic Party. Well, I wouldn't call her the leader of the party. Uh, Biden's the leader, but Biden is like a lot of leaders say, tell me where my followers are going so I can catch up. Uh, and, and AOC is the most media savvy and flamboyant of this group, but hardly really representative. These are serious legislators, uh, which I don't quite count her as yet, uh, on the progressive side. And they have to be, you know, I I salute them because they're they're making the most of their moment. But uh, it is their moment right now. I have so many things to ask you about. I'm going to try as best I can to segue them properly, but sometimes it's going to be just random. You're doing podcasts. You're going on, you're talking to podcasters. Um, which I think is terrific. And by the way, it's great that we could have a real conversation as opposed mm-hmm. to a lot of cable news shows. Um, was that something that you hesitated to do? This no. is your second time here. No, I go to where, where book readers are. And the kind of people who listen to podcasts are the kind of people who understand books and like books. I, for all the chatter about the new media, I think books since Gutenberg and still to today are the primary carriers of ideas. Uh, I think ideas have consequences and think I, I think only ideas have large and lasting consequences. Uh, so podcasts are a welcome addition. I, I, I don't tweet. I've never tweeted. Someone tweets twice a week, some X snippets from my columns. 
I'm told I have a Facebook page. I've never seen it. Uh, th- that stuff just doesn't interest me. Podcasts are the equivalent of long form journalism. And that's fine. I agree. I love books and I also love podcasts. And I think it may be one of the only technological innovations in this uh, journalism communications world that is a positive, <laughs> largely a positive, a net positive uh, impact. But that brings us to Twitter. I, I, I think that um, you can't underestimate the impact that that has had, I think, very negatively in driving our politics, whether it's Donald Trump or AOC. And um, I feel like in some ways, because I came of age during the post-World War II consensus, that things today feel very weird to me, including social media. I wonder, though, if actually things today are more similar to the way they were, let's say, around the time of the American Revolution, where you had those infamous scribblers and the Republican newspaper you ever think about, it's a weird thing to bring up, but I wanted to see if, if you'd ever thought of that. Oh, I have. And it, people say, gee, is it worse than ever? Well, actually, the 1790s, when Americans were A, voracious readers of newspapers, and B, the newspapers were more often not aligned with parties and sometimes funded by the parties. When Jefferson was Secretary of State, he gave lucrative printing contracts to sympathetic papers, and the Federalists did the same thing. And C, in the 1790s, something happened that the found framers neither anticipated nor desired, which is the emergence of parties. And we had to begin to develop an ethic of oppositional rhetoric. And it was pretty coarse until we began to get the hang of it. So there was that. Then there was the 1850s when we were preparing to kill 600,000 Americans in a dispute about whether or not one group of human beings could own another group of human beings. That was pretty buff. The Red Scare after the 1920s, when uh, the Palmer raids from Attorney General Palmer swept up and even deported lots of perfectly innocent Americans. Uh, we've been through bad times before. This, What makes this time interesting to me is in, in the 1850s, we were arguing about stuff. You could say, well, we could write a law about that in the 1790s. The uh, question was banks and uh, the proper scope and competence of the federal government. What are we arguing about today? How would you write a law to make Trump people happy? Seriously. The problem is that the pursuit of happiness has become the pursuit of the unhappiness of the other team. And uh, that makes for a perpetual, unsatisfactory, curdled nature of our politics. Do you think it's the result of, I was just talking to David David Fromm, and he brought up this idea that because we are so prosperous, that all that is left is self-actualization, you know, like on Maslow's hierarchy, we've met all of our fundamental needs. And is this just the natural like end or like, you know, uh, of, of modernity? I don't think so. I don't think, I mean, human cussedness is, is built into the creature, I suppose. And, and the fact that we don't have to worry so much about where to find firewood uh, does give ample scope for cussedness. But I, th- I think there are other issues here. First, I don't want to be a technological determinist, but uh, the fact is the social media uh, have removed all the gatekeepers to the public forum. We used to have editors and the mainstream media for all its faults did have responsibilities and mechanisms of accountability. Now you can be stark raving mad and brimming over with conspiracy theories and you can give them um, speech isn't just cheap. It's free. Absolutely no expense. Uh, Furthermore, social media gives great velocity to stupidity. I've, I've wondered over time whether the quantity of stupidity is fairly constant over time relative to the size of the population. I'm no longer so confident of that, uh, but maybe it's still constant. It's just that, again, the velocity makes it so conspicuous. I do think, if you believe as I do, that politics is indeed downstream from culture, that 
what the most interesting things going on in America today are cultural. They're not checking the latest sulfuric belch from Mar Lago. It's the way we raise children and what produced the kind of children who go to college demanding freedom from speech and safe spaces and bias response teams to track down micro, you know, how did those people come about? So I, I, in my book, I write a whole bunch about the weird goings on in academia and the parenting that I, in my judgment, has produced the children that account for the weird goings on. And I know you, you sort of famously take a shot at denim. Ha, yes. Um, and I'm so I'm assuming that denim is is you don't really specifically hate, uh, you know, denim. It's 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 a symbolic of of like uh, people who don't grow up, maybe. Both. I do hate denim, but uh, yes, uh, it, it's the it's what I call the airport concourse experience. You're sitting in the airport. And you watch people going by, and a 42-year-old father and his 12-year-old son walk by, and they're dressed exactly alike. Running shoes, blue jeans, T-shirt. If mom's there, she's wearing blue jeans. And the thought does occur that we used to have demarcations in changing stages of life. And when we stopped being a child, we put away childish things. Second Corinthians, I think. Uh, and we dress differently. Now we've blurred these, partly because of the infantilization of the American adult and the perpetual infantilization of American children. And I think it's deplorable. I, All I, right, let me just play. I, I own a pair of jeans. I wore it once. And I had, I had to because uh, Senator Dan, Jack Danforth's 70th birthday party was a country music theme. So I had to buy a pair. That is great. But I didn't inhale. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, no, I, this is something, I want to play devil's advocate, though, for a second, because, you know, there's this thing called neoteny. I think I'm pronouncing it right. It's the preservation of, of kind of a winsomeness of, of childhood qualities, like not childishness, but childhood qualities. And I do think that I agree with you. I mean, as a conservative, my kids know I'm dad. I, I want to be their friend, but I'm dad first, you know, and that's, I think it's important to keep that. Um, by the same token though, I, you know, I think a lot of our dads and granddads, uh, were sort of in the Mad Men era where like, I'm the, I'm the dad and I'm going to have the three martini lunch. They were sort of suppressing things sometimes. And I think that led to maybe they weren't connected to their kids as much. What do you think of, of that other extreme? I'm in favor of suppressing things. I think what the result of suppression things, many things, is called civilization. We suppress our appetites. We control our passions. And uh, you can call that with Freud repression. I call it civilization. That's a great answer. Um, you look good. You look really good. You look, you could be 45. <laughs> Is it jeans or is, is there a secret? Well, the, as and by jeans, I don't mean denim, but uh, thank you know. God, yes. Well, as, as is the case with probably far too much of life, uh, the explanation is I, I was very astute in choosing my parents. Uh, we know that family structure and family legacies uh, are, are tremendously complicating factors in trying to produce genuine equality of opportunity. Uh, but there it is. Uh, and actually, we want families to be focused on the welfare of their children. And some may be better at it than others, and that will exacerbate inequality. And that's just too bad. Because if you say you're for liberty, you're for inequality, get over it. You are thought of by some as um, an elitist. Yes, of course. Um, and it is interesting to me that the conservative you know, we've got these two political parties and these two kind of great political ideologies in America, but it is the conservative party that has become the more populist party, at least right now. What do you make of that? I make the following. It is 
surely an indisputable truism that the question is not whether elites shall rule, but which elites. Um, and the challenge of democracy is to get mass consent to worthy elites. Uh, you're quite right that populism has infected the Republican Party. And this matters because the Republican Party hitherto had been the vehicle for conservatism. And whatever populism is, conservatism isn't. Populism, to put it in the characteristically dyspeptic formulation of H.L. Mencken's definition of democracy is the belief that the people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. Uh, populism is the belief that public passions are self-ratifying and that they should be translated as quickly and directly as possible into public policy. None of this is nonsense about refining and filtering public opinion through representative institutions. The principle of Republican, small r, Republican government is representation. The people don't decide issues. They decide who will decide. Is that elitism? Of course it's elitism. Uh, and of course we want to find people who are exceptional. <laughs> There's a, when Robert Taft was called Mr. Republican, senator from Ohio, died in the early 50s of cancer. Uh, someone w once asked his wife, he says, is your husband... Uh, a common man. She said, good God, no. He was first in his class at Yale, first in his class in law school. The people of Ohio would put up with a common man. Uh, that's It's embracing, it seems to me, that she said, but uh, a lot of people think and more people should say. Love it. You mentioned earlier the pursuit of happiness. Your book is called American Happiness and Discontent. Why, why happiness? Why, why do we talk about the word happiness and why like, we hold it in such esteem? Uh, well, the Declaration tells us to, to begin with. Uh, we are the only nation ever founded on a good idea, and that is that individuals should be free to, divine, to define happiness as they will and pursue it as they will. Uh, part of American exceptionalism is that we had our constitution does not tell, say what government must do for us, but what it may not do to us as we go about our business of defining our happiness. Uh, to Enlightenment philosophers, uh, happiness was the reasonable human aspiration. It's not pleasure, it's different. Happiness is a richer concept. Uh, it's, it's taking worthy pleasure in in, in worthy outcomes and in worthy preoccupations. So it's not, it's not an amoral celebration of hedonism, but it is what America is about. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of it. Now, I happen to believe that the pursuit of happiness is happiness. Uh, sort of like uh, Camus' essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, Sisyphus rolls the boulder to the top of the mountain and it thing always rolls back down. He keeps trying. The last line of Camus, last line of his essay is one imagines, one must imagine Camus happy because he's uh, striving. That's built into the pursuit of happiness. I think that maybe uh, is tied to your love of baseball. That's a, 162 games a year. Um, you, you, you go to the ballpark every day, you, you win some, you lose some, sometimes it rains. Um, have you seen, I'm sure you've seen the movies like uh, Bull Durham and Moneyball. Oh, cool. have, you, have you talked about, I don't know if you've ever talked about it. I, I, Bull Durham's one of my favorite movies. I, I, I love Moneyball as well. Yeah, Billy Beans, uh, about whom Moneyball is, is a good friend of mine. Uh, yeah, look, <clears throat> Baseball is what I want society to be, which is a, a severe meritocracy. 162 games in 183 days, you are your record. At the end of the day, you can say, we're better than this. No, that's what you are. We've figured that out. Every team goes to spring training knowing they're going to win 60 games unless they're the Orioles. Every team goes knowing they're going to lose 60 games. You play the whole thing to sort out the middle 42. 
And if you win 10 out of 20 games, you're definitionally mediocre, mediocre. If you win 11 out of 20 games, you're on the outskirts of the postseason. So little things add up, and it's, a, it's an unforgiving schedule. And again, as I said, at the end of the day, you are what your record says you are. Now, Moneyball, of course, was the Michael Lewis book, No Relation, uh, and then a very good Brad Pitt movie. Um, but it's about using analytics and data, which I'm torn on this because I love the movie and I love how Billy Bean did it in order to compete as a small market franchise against the Yankees. But increasingly, I hate the use of data and analytics um, in baseball. I'm torn. What's your take on that? Well, the data that Billy used is, looks prehistoric now. It was on base percentage. He gets on base. Good. Sign him up. He's, a, he's an undervalued asset. Great. No, that's, that's good. But now we've got spin rates and launch angles and barrel, uh, a certain, they say a certain hits a barrel, a certain kind of hard hit. It's entirely different now. Look, I, I, I'm an enlightenment uh, devotee, so I can't be against data. I'm not against information. But uh, I'm also not against altering institutions when facts change. And the fact is that we now have the sport of the three true outcomes. Strikeouts, home runs, walks. It's boring. The pace of pay, play is bad. In the most watched game of last season, the sixth and final game of the World Series. There were 54 outs, exactly half of them, 27 strikeouts. The ball was put in play on average once every six minutes, and in the last 25 minutes of the game, the ball was put in play twice. Now, that is not entertaining, and baseball, news bulletin here, is in the entertainment business. So it's going to have to do something to get the ball in play anyway. The stupendous athletes in baseball, the Nolan Arenados and Javi Baez and all the rest, uh, spend a lot more time with leather on their hands and with wood in their hands. They're defenders most of the time. So let's get the ball in play. Let's see them work their magic. Yeah, and there's something about the romance of baseball that I think the romance is, is stripped out when we get talking about launch angles and stuff like that. And I was just watching this 30 for 30 the other day about the 1986 Mets. And they brought in, like, I think it was Lenny Dykstra <laughs> to pinch hit. And they were saying, like, you would never do that today. You would never bring in a left-handed hitter against a left-handed pitcher. But, of course, it worked. And, like, yeah, I get that you're playing the percentages, but sometimes there's magic, right? Isn't baseball at least partly about magic? Well, no. I, again, I have to disagree. I, I titled my best-selling book. In fact, the one that sold more than the other 15 combined, I call it Men at Work, because I was tired of this boys of summer stuff. These are men, it's work, and it's dangerous. Uh, look, we, we, we want the good old days when Koufax pissing, pitching against Marischal was destination television. Uh, Seaver against Gibson. Wow, let's tune it in. Now, we have this ludicrous statistic, quality start. Imagine telling Warren Spahn, winning his left-handed pitcher in the history of baseball, that was a quality start. His quality starts where you pitch nine innings to him, unless it was extra innings and you went right on. Uh, so I'm against the romance of baseball. I, 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 to me, the romance of such is, is is the work, the intense professionalism of these people. Um, someone on Twitter, by the way, this is the one time Twitter actually can be good. I asked the wisdom of crowds, what to ask you. Someone wanted to know, what were you doing when the Cubs won the World Series? Uh, I was uh, sitting in a hotel room watching it. it uh, I actually had, I, I'd given a talk that night and I had in my contract for years uh, that if the Cubs were in the World Series, the contract was void. Uh, and and they actually expected me to cancel the appearance, but I they were I I talked to them before and they were very good people, so I didn't. That is awesome. I think we're breaking new ground here. I had not heard, despite yeah. all the podcasts and the prep work I did, because you know the work is where it's at. 
I yeah. did not know that story. One thing, um, your columns, if you just, you know, leaf through this book, you like to start out columns with a quote or, or more than one, but often one quote. Uh, why do you do that? Where did you get the idea? Why is that important? I don't know. I don't do it all that often, but uh, occasionally it just sets the theme for what you get. I've got, I'm pretty strict about re- limiting myself to 750 words. So uh, if you can set the theme and point the le- reader in that direction, I do that. Uh, I, I, I just filed a column this morning, if I can find it, which I can't, uh, that I, I begin with a quote. And it's from Edna St. Vincent Millay saying, life isn't one damn thing after another. It's the same damn thing over and over and over again. And it's my way of saying this is what the Democrats are doing. going to do it again. They're going to do what they did in 65 and 66. They're going to produce a, a reaction against them. You know, about writing a column. Most Americans don't read newspapers. And most Americans who read newspapers don't read the op-ed pages. And this depresses some columnists. I find it invigorating for the following reason. It means that the minority of newspaper readers, who are themselves a minority, who come to the op-ed pages, come there of their own volition, which means they're interested in this stuff, which means they're very apt to have a mental pantry full of information and opinions, thoughts. So you don't, you, you not only don't need to write down to them, you dare not do that because they're intellectually upscale, frankly. There I go again, sound like an elitist, which of course I am. Uh, so it, it enables you to do a lot more with 750 words than you could do if every day you had to say, by the way, there are three branches of government. Yeah. Um, so, did I mean, obviously. By, did you know, by the way, that one of our new senators, Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama, who was former football coach at Auburn, says he knows there are three branches of government, the president, the House, and the Senate. <laughs> Tells you where we are. Indeed. Um, so obviously you you still are thinking of yourself as a newspaper columnist. When yes. I, I bet you most people who consume your information today are getting it online. They are. And most my, most of the readers of Washington Post, and I'm in hundreds of other papers, but most Washington Post readers get it online. Uh, but that's fine. It's still reading and it's still the principle applies. You gotta, you have to make an effort to get there. And that's so one, the kind of filter that filters out the people who aren't serious. One of the quotes, one of these quotes you used at the beginning of a column is from L.P. Hartley. The past is a foreign country. I've thought about this. I think that if I had the choice of going to Lon- living in London in 2021 or living in Washington, D.C., in 1921, I would actually feel more at home in modern time in London in modern time. I don't think people think about that. It's a weird, it's another weird concept I wanted to throw at you. It is, of course, Faulkner in his Nobel Prize acceptance lecture famously said the past isn't even past. And this explains why we fight so much about the teaching of American history. And I write a bunch about this in my new book including the 1619 Project and all that from the New York Times. Orwell famously, but not famously enough, I'm afraid, said in 1984, uh, he who controls uh, the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. That's what the New York Times explicitly set out to do, is reframe American history, not because it was worried that we weren't thinking about 1619 right, but because they want to influence the future. Um, Now, I think the 1619 Project is, A, a bad thing for a newspaper to do, and second, is demonstrably historically illiterate. Uh, I mean, just factually wrong. But leaving that aside, uh, we ought to fight about the teaching of American history for exactly the reason Orwell said. It's just such a horrible thing for someone to do. I'm talking about the New York Times. I mean, they're trying to 
redefine America's founding wrongly. They don't even have the facts on their side. They want to tear down our country so that young people today see it as born in sin, conceived in sin, and they don't let young people won't love their own country, won't respect their own country, won't want to fight for their own country. What? Who scares you more? I know you voted for Biden, and we've already talked about Trump trying to steal the election, but you're also a conservative. Does the left scare you more or the right today? <laughs> that's, that sadly is an excellent question. Uh, uh, the right, they scare me in different ways. The right scares me in that it, they, they've simply, they've seceded from the reality community, people who are disciplined by facts and evidence. The left scares me because they really don't like the country we have. They say, well, we're great patriots. We just we're, we, we just love a country that hasn't been brought into existence yet, and that we're, we're going to do that. Uh, the, I, the left also scares me because they, rather than resist the destructive natural proclivities of democracy, they exacerbate them. Uh, see, I, I think the for all the talk about the discord in our country, I'm much more frightened by a consensus. And it's as broad as the Republic, it's as deep as the Grand Canyon, and goes from Elizabeth Warren to Ted Cruz, and it is this. We should have a large, omnipresent, omniprovident entitlement state and not pay for it. Everyone's agreed on that. Uh, there is a permanent powerful incentive in the political class. And the political class is more united by its class interest than divided by ideology. Permanent powerful incentive to run large deficits, peacetime deficits, deficits in prosperity, always deficits. Trump ran a trillion dollar budget deficit at full employment and 2% growth. Now, of course, the public likes this. They get a dollar's worth of government. They're charged 80 cents for it. Part of the, their current consumption of government goods and services is fobbed off on the unborn and unconsenting future generations. The problem is we used to borrow money for the future, fought wars, built harbors and roads and bridges for the future. Now we borrow from the future for our current happiness. And if that isn't decadent, I don't know what is. You have said that you think or hope that the public is going to get bored with Trump. He probably won't run again because he doesn't want to lose again. Um, I've heard you say that you think that Biden will not run for re-election. Um, Kamala Harris does not seem like a great candidate to me. And then I'm wondering, then who does that mean? Is it, who who are you betting on today? Uh, DeSantis? Who no, who should we? No, no. DeSantis, for all I know, is the Ed Muskie, Scott Walker of this cycle, right? or Rudy Giuliani, someone who looked great until the starting gun. Who knows? I'm not judging him. It's way too early, but there's enormous amount of talent out there on, on in both parties, such that. It's going to be really depressing if this nation of 331 million people goes to the polls in November 2024 and chooses between an 82-year-old incumbent president and a 78 or whatever he will be, 78-year-old rejected ex-president. I mean, good grief. How depressing can you get? Someone asked me to ask you about uh, Youngkin, who's running next door in Virginia for governor if you think he has a shot or what you think of him. I've, I've not met him. Uh, uh, of course, he has a shot. It's a, it's a fairly close state. It's an increasingly blue state. Uh, so he has a, an uphill climb because uh, I assume that Terry McAuliffe, his opponent, will tie him closely to Trump, and Trump is anathema in northern Virginia where the, uh, the growth of the state has been. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know. I think the last question I have for you, uh, you and I have, I'm sure, and, and Mr. Will, I'm sure you read all my columns at the Beast, <laughs> but you and I have been in agreement on um, things such as the vaccine mandate, which I think vaccines are great. 
mandates. I don't like telling businesses what I didn't like it when DeSantis tried to tell businesses they couldn't, you know, uh, ask, have their employees or their, their customers vaccinate. I don't like it when Biden tells businesses uh, to do it. And obviously this is, you know, a pro Congress. Um, not it's not that they had their authority usurped. It was that they gave it over to executive That's agencies. Right. What could Congress do? What, what sort of reforms could be made to restore legislating back to the back to the legislative branch? Well, the Supreme Court, which is reluctant to do this, could be an enormous help if it would breathe life back into the non-delegation doctrine, which is basically that John Locke was right when he said in the second treatise on government, legislators can make laws, but not other legislators. What Congress essentially does is give essentially legislative powers to the president or to executive agencies under his control. They don't so much pass laws as sentiments. They'll say, we have an education bill. Our bill is we should have good education. You guys in the education department fill in the details. Well, that's, it, it seems to me essentially legislative judgments are being fobbed off on executive agencies and the Supreme Court could stop that. If the judiciary doesn't enforce things like that, limits on Congress, Congress won't limit itself. It won't limit its delegation of powers to the executive. If Congress won't rein in presidents saying no, as a matter of fact, Police powers belong to the states. Vaccine mandates are state responsibilities, therefore. If the court won't do it, no one will. It won't get done. Which is why, to come back to where we almost started, I'm for judicial engagement, is our current phrase among correct thinking conservatives. And we have come full circle. That is a good place to end it, everybody. Uh, get the book, American Happiness and discontents the unruly torrent 2008 to 2020 george will thank you for coming back on the news i enjoyed it thanks for having me